I went and I asked for a blessing because this talk begins at 13.13 and uh, <coughs> it may just be a sign of what's about to come. Um, I've got this yellow bee that's hanging around my head. I hope that doesn't scare you half as much as it scares me. And it sounds very strong and powerful, which I don't feel. So it's, there's a disconnect there about my voice and how I feel inside. Um, I still get all those horrible butterflies in my heart heart and in my tummy every time I'm supposed to talk although I've been doing this for close to five or six years now and um, and I've been doing it in the university and I've been doing it in the podcast and I've, I, I should have overcome them by now but I suppose the reason why I'm always absolutely panicked before a talk is that I do hope that every time I speak somewhere with someone is it is, as his eminence said, a heart-to-heart -heart sort of conversation. And, um, and it's very difficult to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation um, when you have a bishop in front of you. Uh, <laughs> although you are one of my favorite bishops, and I love you, and I'm so grateful for receiving me. And, but unfortunately, you are a bishop, so I'm terrified of you. And, uh, <laughs> And also, you know, priests like Father Panayotis who just look outside, look what he did. I mean, this is a priest, not me. And, uh, and then all of you wonderful, wonderful young people, I'm, I'm so afraid that I would say something wrong that could, you know, not benefit you or quite the contrary, harm you. So I'm always filled with uh, anticipation and, and, and just restlessness. Um, because I'm so afraid, I've actually hidden somewhere in a room and I've, I've taken a few notes on my phone, which I almost never do. They're just notes, things that came to me during the Divine Liturgy, and I'm going to focus on, on those. Um, and I will start from what we read today in the Gospel, uh, this beautiful, beautiful reading from the Gospel with um, Christ giving life to a young man. And Every time I hear something like that, every time I read one of his miracles, every time I see how gloriously beautiful and loving and forgiving Christ is, I actually feel a bit of pain and angst, almost guilt or shame, because I feel there is a disconnect, and I'm sorry to use that word at the connect conference, but I do feel there's a disconnection between this Christ who gives life to the world and who I am, and truly what I'm pointing at is who we all are here. I feel there's a disconnect between this loving God who, who came into the world to save the world, who came into the world willing to give his life for us, and me and you. I feel in some ways that um, I remember when I was 19 and I discovered Christ and I felt so much love and I felt so welcome that all I wanted to do, all my heart wanted to do was to run towards him and offer myself to him entirely, which is, you know, why I ended up being a monk. I didn't want any sort of 50% of myself to him and 50% to the world or to myself. And there's something wrong there when we have this gloriously beautiful and loving God and we do not somehow take that love and show it into the world. There's a disconnect between the God whom we know, who is just love, of again, his eminence said, love is everything, everything else is just a decoration. But then why is it that we, who are his faithful, do not show that onto the world? How is it that this loving God has embraced me, but I am not equally willing to embrace the world? How is it that we all run towards Christ to receive salvation, to receive forgiveness, to always be once again healed, 
but the world around us is afraid of us. And that is the reaction of the world in relation to Christians today. If we are to be honest, if we are to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, there is a disconnect there, and there's no one to blame except ourselves. You know, even throughout this conference, uh, I've heard beautiful talks about God's love, and we are so ready to hear how much He loves us. We are so thirsty to be told that we don't need to hold on to our guilt. We don't need to hold on to the shame of our sinfulness. That it's never too late. It's never too uh, far into our sinfulness to come back to receive forgiveness. We are so thirsty and so willing to embrace this loving God. As long as we keep Him, you know, here in our little tribe. Be that tribe myself my family, my nationality, or my church. And there is something profoundly wrong in that. We should be to the world what Christ is to us. The world should run to us the way we run to the world. We should be a drop of healing and love, not fear or poison into the world. The same way that Christ always is nothing to us, except healing, forgiveness, and love. This disconnect does not sit rightly within my heart. And it's about this that I wanted to speak to you today, because this is what God put in my heart five minutes ago. You know, when I was now... <laughs> it's not my fault, it's the fault of this yellow bee. <laughs> In fact, I feel quite, um, very much like under a yoke. I'm trying to keep my voice down and not bubble up as I would otherwise. <laughs> so be grateful to the bee. This is the theme of the day. Be grateful to the bee. Um, I forgot what I wanted to say, so I'll just start all over again. Let's start from the beginning. We are here to speak about faithfulness. What is faithfulness to you? I don't think that anybody has actually attempted a definition of sorts uh, throughout this conference. And for me, I kept thinking faithfulness comes from faith, which is then, you know, made into an adjective, faithful, and then it's back into a noun, faithfulness, and it's a back and forth sort of a, a play with the word. But faithfulness really is the practical application of our faith, isn't it? It is us following someone, believing in someone, having faith in the truth of that someone, and then mirroring that, throwing that, reflecting that back into the world. So then the question really is, if we ask ourselves, who should we be? Because this really is the only question we are faced. Who should we be in this world? We should be like the one to whom we are faithful. And again, this is my experience, and maybe yours is completely different. But when I think of Christ, I see myself again at 19 when I found my way back into the church. And I had nothing good to offer except my sins. And for me, Christ is someone who receives a stranger, me. I had not known him. He knew me before I knew him. And then he opened me. He, he, he received me with his open arms entirely. And you see that in the gospel as well. And you see it in my life as well. Christ is someone who receives a stranger. Christ is someone who receives, embraces, forgives a sinner. Because I most definitely was not a holy person when I was 19. And I'm definitely not a holy person today. And I have a feeling that maybe, except for this clergy table, there aren't many holy people in this room today. We are on our way to holiness, but that's a different story, isn't it? Christ embraced this sinner, and he embraced these sinners here. And we see that in the gospel again, and we see it in our lives. I also think of Christ every time I think of someone who's kind and loving and willing to give his life for those who take his life from him. I think of Christ and I see someone who in the Garden of the Olives, in the Gethsemane Garden, is willing 
to let himself be killed rather than have someone else protect him. The question of whether he should protect himself is not even in the gospel. I mean, it's so ridiculous, they didn't even think to put it in. That's Christ for me. And if this is Christ, then us who are his faithful, those who are faithful to his teaching and should be like him, shouldn't we be the same in this world of ours today? Shouldn't we be the ones who also embrace foreigners and strangers the way Christ does in the gospel and he does in our lives? Shouldn't we be the ones who go out in the streets not to judge sinners, not to condemn sinners or the world, but to do to them what Christ has done to us? Shouldn't they feel the same welcome and love from our part that we felt from Christ when we needed him? So if that's who we should be, why aren't we? What stops you? You are young, you are strong, you've got your whole life ahead of you. So what stops you from being faithful to this loving God? Do you think that because we've come to church that makes us faithful? Do you think that the fruit of faith is that we come to church or that we sign up and we show up for a conference and we sit in a hotel and then we eat together and we have fun together? Is that the fruit of our faith? Is this what Christ died for on a cross? These are blessed things, but not the fruit of our faith. These are tools for us to have faith and to grow in our faith. The fruit of our faith will always end up with us being crucified. The fruit of your faith is for you to go out and welcome a foreigner, welcome a stranger. The fruit of your faith is to go out and hug a sinner. Tell someone who's condemned by everyone, and rightly so, that you love him or you love her despite the sinfulness. The fruit of your faith is to just stand there and be killed if that is the will of God for you, instead of getting a gun out and shooting in order to protect yourself. It's crazy to say it, but no offense, it is crazy to be a Christian. If your faith begins to make sense, then you are not faithful anymore. If your faith is logical, you are no longer serving the living God, you are serving your comfort, and your logic. It's not going to be your brain or your heart or your body that is going to be the tool of knowledge allowing you to meet God. It will be the madness of your faith. It will be walking, you walking out into this world, just walking on water like Peter and hugging the one whom your parents tell you not to hug your priest is slightly afraid of, all your friend, friends are condemning, you're afraid that somebody will see you and post you on Facebook. When you act in faith, I don't know how to imprint this on you, when you act in faith, you are contradicting everything around you. It goes against your brain because your brain cannot encapsulate Christ. It goes against your feeling even, because our feelings and emotions are still created. They have nothing to do with the kingdom to come. When you act in faith, you walk on water. And every time you doubt, and every time you are afraid, every time you listen to your brain or your emotion or your body, you do exactly what Peter did. You begin to sink. It's almost like God intended us to be these amazing, beautiful, wild beasts into the world, fighting for the world, being the crazy ones of the world, the mad ones of the world, the lions of the world. And I look at me and I look at you and I see more or less poodles. 
And I do say that with love. Because if I didn't have love, I would keep my mouth shut and I would just read a pre-prepared paper, get myself out of here and be happy. But I'm willing to take this risk because I do want you to make your life count, not in this world, but in the world to come. Make it count. Go out and fight for the things you believe in, because the things you believe in are the real fruit of your faith. Not going to church again. Going to church is necessary for your faith to be fed, but once it's fed, where is the fruit? That fruit will take you out in front of a prison where your state executes human beings. That capital punishment is inhuman, let alone non-Christian. Get your faith out whenever and wherever somebody gets killed by the use of a gun and tell everyone around you that the right to have a gun is not more important than the life of a human because that human is the image of Christ and when you shoot through that face even if he or she has never heard of Christ he or she still carries the imprint of the image of God because it's the same creator what God written rule or law or constitution is more important than the right that God gave us to be alive and to be free and in this freedom and this life to fight for our salvation. I think the yellow bee wants to escape. <laughs> it doesn't agree. That's okay. Sometimes you have to use force. <laughs> Look, I, um, I forgot about my notes, but that's okay. I don't want you to become just lawyers. I don't want you to be lawyers. I don't want you to be just accountants or just musicians or just artists or just mothers and fathers. You be all of that because you live in the world and you have to. And you be all of that because this church here on this earth needs you to be that and needs your help. But if you limit your identity to being a lawyer or an architect or whatever else and you forget about the fact that God created you in order to roar into this world, in order to make it count, make it matter before him, then you have failed as a human being. The mystery of faithfulness. Well, what's the mystery of it? The mystery is that when you begin to act in faith, you no longer think about your safety. You no longer think about your security. You no longer allow your brain to dictate where you go and what you do and what you say. And you want a proof? Look at me here. The mystery of faithfulness is that the basis of your existence is no longer something created. Because the reality is that our brains, as much as we admire them and as much as we invest in them and as much as we almost worship our brains, our brain is nothing more than a piece of meat. It's a piece of meat in a bunch of juices and will rot as quickly and will smell as badly as any other part of our bodies. Salvation doesn't come from a piece of meat. The reality is also that our hearts and our feelings are also pretty much generated in this world and they are created, they belong to this world. So if you act according to your brains or if you act according to your heart, you're still acting according to an understanding that is generated by a created tool, your brain or your heart. But your faith will take you out of this world your faith will take you out of this createdness because your faith is given to you from above. Your faith doesn't come to you like the knowledge brought to you by your brain. 
and your faith doesn't come to you by the knowledge that comes to you through your heart. Your faith is only given to you through revelation on account of Jesus Christ through him. And when you build your life on your faith, in a miraculous way, you're actually walking on water all your life. When you build your identity in, based on faith, which is non-created, your identity already here has a taste of something that is not created. It may be difficult to understand, but it's actually quite simple. I had a conversation last night about this with a, a bunch of people I love very much, and I was telling them, if you, if, you, if you just say God is great, just in that expression of knowledge and emotion, just through the word great, in Greek or in Russian or Romanian or any of the Orthodox languages, you've imprinted a gender on God, and you've imprinted a number. You've already stated that God is singular. We are limited by the very languages that we use, and we are almost al always limited by the brains that use those languages. The only way to true knowledge, the only way to truth, which is Christ, is faith. And to live on faith means to do the things that will not get you a green tick from your friends or from your families or from those whose approval you are looking for, but will get you the green tick and the approval of Christ. One more thing, and then I've survived and you've survived. <laughs> I love you. I genuinely do, and I pray for you, and I pray that these sacks of skin that sit before me right now <laughs> will find the madness to just have faith and to just act and to not be afraid. You are the chalices of Christ. Go out into the world. You've received him now, when you received communion. Take him out into the world and do not be afraid. It's not your business to protect Christ. If he wanted to be protected, he would not have become incarnate. He would not have gone through the mess of the crucifixion on our account. You are young and talented and you are beautiful before the eyes of God. May he bless you and give you a drop of madness. That's all I pray for. The world needs real, acting, courageous Christians today to stand up for the fruit of their faith, which is always love and always forgiveness and always getting everybody up. If you want to be forgiven, if you do believe that Christ will always forgive you, then let me see that in your actions in this world. Forgive me. That has been everything. If you have any questions for Father Seraphim or, or comments in general, we can take those now and we'll come around. Um, more than happy to. We had a good, uh, a good discussion yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. The deep talks. Thanks for the, uh, the conversation here and the conversations all this weekend. Um, so you you put a lot of like big challenges, very maybe idealistic things. Mm -hmm. Also, some concrete ways to approach some of those issues too. Um, and I was just looking at like going to liturgy, saying daily prayers, going to confession, these mundane kind of things that don't seem like throwing ourselves in cages and going and protesting and doing, you know, the dramatic stuff. Mm -hmm. So how do we look at like those mundane spiritual practices that maybe we might use to turn ourselves into rules? Well, I was hoping. 
forgive me, I was hoping that um, we use those as the tools that feed your faith. That's where the frustration comes out of me, because we are the ones who know Christ. We are the ones who receive him entirely, holy, every time we receive communion. That is what feeds you as a Christian. But you don't live in that building, do you? And that's not anywhere in the gospel. I don't see Christ's commandments being go and confess and receive communion and go home and watch TV. If that had been his commandments, that would be fine. But we don't see that. We see, come follow me. And where does he end up? He ends up on a cross. Why is he on a cross? Out of love. Love for whom? For those who do not deserve that love. You and me. And if we are to follow him, if we are to be faithful to him, it feels like we are being given this wonderful treasure and then we just bury it in the ground or under our beds or in our offices. And I think there's, there's something in the gospel about people who bury that treasure in the ground, and I'm not sure, but they don't end up okay, do they? That's, that's all. It's not about not doing those things. It's about actually achieving the potential of everything that those things give us. Mary, it depends very, very much on how much you care about a certain thing. Not everybody is going to care about everything, and not everyone is going to care to the same degree. But there is something in the gospel called sacrifice. If we only get involved into the world to the point where we do not sacrifice anything in our lives, I don't really think that it matters very much. I really don't think so. I mean, I do not see any of the saints in our calendar having ended up in the calendar not having sacrificed anything. And I don't, I mean, again, there are much nicer, cuter ways to answer this, but I don't want to use those. I do not believe that a life of just going to... <laughs> this is not the life the life is somewhere else. This is not the end of things. We must know that since we are in a church as Christians, correct? And when you hear Christ saying that you can only gain your life when you lose your life, I mean, I don't know what I could add to that and how much clearer I could be given that he is God and I'm just an idiot. There is something we all can do, even simply speaking out. There is something each and every one of us can do. Just don't buy things that, you know, are detrimental to your neighbor or to the environment. Don't, it's, it's so simple to do little things, but now and again, there are people who care so much that are willing to do a real sacrifice. 
And my problem really, which is mine and not yours, is that I do not see inspiration in the church for those people. And I think if we had just one or two or three of those people who were willing to go out and actually stop having a life the way a nun or a monk no longer has a life because they are dedicated to something that speaks to the world, those one or two or three ambassadors of the fruit of our faith would do wonders in this world. And my fear is that we live in a church which is too quiet at a time that does not allow us to be quiet. The way the church has been quiet maybe at the wrong times during the Second World War or the First World War, or the way the church has been quiet perhaps during communism. I mean, it's not the first time that we are just, we are playing it safe. And at times that only ends up with an apology decades or centuries later. I think we can go home. <laughs> Thank you. I'll go and get a blessing.